Okay, hello, good evening, and welcome from Phoenixville Public Library. I'm Mark Pinto, the Adult Services Director here, and it's our pleasure to welcome local author Mark Lanyon to Phoenixville Library tonight. He is the author of the book Abolition and the Underground Railroad in Chester County. Very appropriate for our upcoming celebration of Juneteenth. Uh, Mark's new book captures the rich history of anti-slavery activity that transformed Chester County into a vital region in the nation's fight for freedom. A little bit about Mark, since retiring from a career in behavioral health, he's been able to spend time uh, doing research into the rich history of anti-slavery activity in Chester County, including the Underground Railroad, the abolitionist movement, and the founding of Lincoln University. Uh, those of you in the room, uh, copies of the book are available here for purchase and signing. And a little bit later, Mark will tell you folks on Zoom how you can get your copy of the book. Please hold all questions until the end of Mark's presentation. Uh, and at that, at that time, those on Zoom can either unmute themselves or type the question in the chat. We'll let you know when that happens. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Lanyon. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come here this evening. And uh, a little bit of introduction, how this, people say, well, how did you come to write this book? And my sister lives in California, and a friend of hers, come on in. We, we just started like two seconds ago, so come on in. This room, welcome. It's like charge, you have to sit up front, sorry. <laughs> So my sister gave a friend of hers an orchid, the flower of the orchid, and uh, her friend said, oh, orchids, that's really pretty. And my sister said, well, my brother lives near Longwood Gardens where they have a lot of orchids. And she said, oh, her friend said, oh, Long Longwood Gardens, well, that's close to Lincoln University. My husband went to Lincoln University. And so my sister said, well, my brother went to Lincoln University as well. So like a week later, I get an email, and his name was Ernie. Ernie, Mark, Mark, Ernie, you two talk. So <laughs> we get talking, it turns out Ernie, Dr. Ernest Levister, come on in. <laughs> uh, his great-grandfather was Thomas Henry Amos, and his great-grand-uncle was James Ralston Amos. And the two Amos brothers, along with uh, Reverend Dickey, helped found Lincoln University. So he has a lot of history there. So I said, wow, that's really something. So I got to tell him, I mean, he was like, well, this is about my family. I said, well, I'll tell you about my family. My cousin is Harry Beecher Stowe. So we were both like, well, who, who's more impressive? You know? <laughs> so, with that, you know, hearing about a, the two Amos brothers and have, my having gone to Lincoln University, I thought, well, let me just do a little, play around a little bit of research because I'm not from this area. And, you know, find out about Hansonville, I'll talk about a little bit later, Hosanna Church, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then up came the Underground Railroad. Well, I'm from Massachusetts, and the only underground railroad we know is called the subway. <laughs> so, uh, and my wife grew up in media, so she's like, you don't know about the underground railroad? I'm like, how would I know about the underground railroad? You know? yeah. So, um, and during my talk, I'm going to talk about freedom seekers, not runaway slaves, not fugitives, because that makes them sound like they're bad people. These are people who were in pursuit of freedom. And that's one of the things Juneteenth, it, 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 it talks about, you know, that's celebrating the fact that it was like two years after the fact, four years after the fact, they just, they found out, oh, we're free, this is awesome, but, so, and this is the thing that really impressed me was living, I, I live in Westville, my wife and I, by the way, June 3rd was our 50th wedding anniversary, we have three grandchildren, so two daughters and three grandchildren, but, and you're like, what does that have to do with the book? Nothing, but I thought I'd throw that in there. I'm pretty impressed myself. <laughs> so I was amazed when I started doing a little bit of research how much rich history is in this area. You know, we live in West Grove within a 15-mile radius. You know, that's like what the little map shows over there. Everything is within a 15-mile radius, which is just phenomenal. So the title of the book, 
is abolition in the Underground Railroad. Abolition, that means to abolish something. Underground Railroad, railroads transport people, product. So what was it about? It was to abolish slavery, and the Underground Railroad transported enslaved people on their road to freedom. Slavery was legalized in Pennsylvania in 1700. By 1776, the Quakers determined slavery was wrong. You know, they said all children are God's creation and we shouldn't own slaves. And they said, if you choose to own slaves, you are no longer part of the society, you're out. So most people, most Quakers got rid of their slaves. And Pennsylvania was the first state in the Union to approve legislation to end slavery. It was called the Gradual Emancipation Act of 1780. And in 1790, in Pennsylvania, there were 3,737 slaves. By 1840, there were 64 slaves. By 1860, there were none. You know, it took a little while. So there were four events that had a major impact on the freedom seekers in Chester County. The first was the Mason-Dixon Line. I'm sure you've all heard of the Mason-Dixon Line. Not being from around here, I thought the Mason-Dixon line was, you crossed over, you ate grits and talked with a funny accent. But, sorry. <laughs> but what happened was William Penn and Lord Calvert, they had a boundary dispute because one of the sea captains came to William Penn and said, you do know Philadelphia is located in the colony of Maryland. He's like, no it's not. And they said, yes it is. So they hired some local surveyors. They weren't happy with what was going on. So. They uh, reached out to the Royal Observatory in London for surveyors and overcame Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. And the first order of the business was to determine where was Philadelphia located. And they did some surveying in Philly and determined, yes, indeed, it is in, uh, it was in the colony of Pennsylvania. But they needed a geographic uh, reference point from which they could make accurate celestial readings because they went around and they did their you know, readings on the ground, but they wanted to confirm it. So finally they found it in January 7, 1764 on the Harlan Farm up near Emeryville. And uh, they put a stone there to remember where it was. And let's see if this works. Where do I go down? I go to sleep. <laughs> on Zoom, it's not possible for people in the room and you on Zoom to see the speaker necessarily at the same time, unfortunately. That's why you should have come here. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the um, stargazer stone right there. And what, the, what blew my mind when I was doing the research is they used the North Star as a reference point to, de to verify their readings on the ground. And this was the same North Star years later that freedom seekers would use for their journey northward. You know, and I, got, I still get chills when I you know, hear that. So Mason Dixon, they often re returned here to the spot, to the White Quartz Stone. And the local farmers watched Mason Dixon. They'd set the tripod up over the stone. And they'd be looking up at the sky. And the local farmers said, well, look at these crazy Brits. They're, they're, they're you know, we're gazing at the stars. There's this stone. We'll call it the Stargazer Stone. So the local farmers were the ones that they did that. And this is located about 13 miles from my house. And in 1768, the survey was completed. Penn and Calvert families approved it. Uh, and Mason Dixon went back to England. Had it not been for events later on, the Mason Dixon line would have been just a boundary that people pretty much forgot about. You know, it just was on the map, it was no big deal. But the Harlan descendants who had the farm deeded the, this to Chester County Historical Society in 1908. And Chester County Historical Society built this, the stone wall around it to protect it. And the Stargazer Stone 
is listed on the National Register of Historical Places. It's also one of 20, 125 places in the United States that's a national civil engineering landmark. And so if you have children, grandchildren, and you want to take a little day trip, awesome place to go because this is living history. You figure this has been here since like 1763. You know, it was pretty amazing. Now, the second event that occurred that had an impact on freedom seekers was the Fugitive Slave Act of 17, 1793. What was happening is uh, freedom seekers could be seized and turned over to their masters, and also there were legal consequences for anyone helping the you know, run away, the, the freedom seekers, or people who were hiding them. They could be persecuted or prosecuted as well. Then came the, the Pennsylvania Personal Liberty Laws. And the first law, 1820, was to protect freedom seekers, to say, no, you can't cross over into Pennsylvania to take these freedom seekers away. Then, but the, what happened was the, the, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 encouraged unscrupulous slave catchers to capture free blacks and sell them into slavery. So that's why the Personal Liberty Law of 1826 was passed so that to help protect not only the free blacks, but also protect the freedom seekers. The fourth event that was really the, probably the most heinous was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. This was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 on steroids. What it meant was all I had to do if I was a slave catcher was go to court and say, that person is mine. I didn't have to have any proof, I didn't have to have any documentation, and the judge would be like, boom, done, take him away, or take her away. It was incredible. It was called the Blood, Bloodhound Act because they used bloodhounds to track down. So this is a little bit of history as to why did the Underground Railroad start? Why did the abolitionist movement really gain traction? Because of these laws that were being passed and the way freedom seekers were being mistreated. And this act was considered one of the major factors for the beginning of the Civil War because people started realizing this is just wrong, just flat out wrong. So let's see how you do this. Yay. <laughs> no, there it is, the Mason Dixon line. So um, this turned out to be the world's most famous boundary. And for a freedom seeker, reaching the Mason-Dixon line meant a life filled with promise, liberty, and self-respect. And to assist freedom seekers, the Underground Railroad was born. Kenneth Square is about eight miles from my house. Now, what's Kenneth Square known for? What's its nickname? Mushroom, Mushroom Capital. Mm -hmm. Mushroom Capital of the World. But before that, it was known as the hub of the Underground Railroad because there were more Underground Railroad stations in the Kenneth Square area than anywhere else in the U.S. And just like the real, real railroads, there were stations, there were conductors, there were station masters, there were agents, and the Underground Railroad was actually the first major act of civil disobedience since the American Revolution. It's estimated that close to 50,000 freedom seekers came through Chester County. And the origin of the term, there were some slave catchers that were caught on the trail of some uh, freedom seekers, and all of a sudden they disappear. And they're like, there must be an underground railroad or something. How, how, where, where do they go? <laughs> so it was most active between 1835 and 1855, the underground railroad. And some of the station masters in the Kennedy area included Thomas Garrett, he from Wilmington. And if you go down to the Harry Tubman Museum in Cambridge, they have a display about uh, uh, him. And his was the only major underground railroad station south of the Mason-Dixon line. And he didn't personally transport freedom seekers. He hired local free blacks to transport the freedom seekers. And it included people like Cummings, Munson, Severin Johnson, Harry Craig, Joseph Walker. And these men, along with Thomas Garrett's help, transported close to 3,000 freedom seekers. And most of them would come from Wilmington right up 52 to Kennett and then beyond. So revered and esteemed was Thomas Garrett, he was called our Moses as a sign of honor. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, 
Look at that. <laughs> Aunt Preston, her house is about a mile and a half from, from my house. She, hers was a major station on the Underground Railroad, very close to the Mason Dixon line, about eight miles away. As a medical doctor, she could provide medical care because most of the freedom seekers, you know, they didn't have hospitals that well. They had hospitals, but they weren't open to the, to the slaves, and they weren't well, for the most part, they weren't well taken care of, the enslaved people. So when they came, they really needed some help. But so she provided food, medical care, and she would often transport her visitors to the next Underground Railroad station. And she was a Quaker, so what she would do is dress up as a female. She'd put a bonnet on and a dress, and they'd be riding along in her carriage in a sleeve. Catcher would come up and go, oh, hello, uh, Dr. Preston. Oh, oh, friend of yours, this, hello, friend. You know, and they just ride off. You know, just mm -hmm. off to the next place. This is Oakdale. It's the home of Isaac and Diana Mendenhall. This was a major station on the Underground Railroad. And there was a secret room between a huge fireplace and a wall. The barn at Oakdale was used to hide the male freedom seekers. The spring house was used to hide the female freedom seekers and the children. And the freedom seekers called Isaac Uncle Isaac, and Dinah was known as Aunt Dinah. And one story about Dinah, she was in her, the kitchen. She just made a meal for one of the freedom seekers, a male freedom seeker. But it was pounding on the front door. So she just finished baking bread. So she opens up the oven door, pushes the guy in, slams the door shut, goes to the friend, the slave catcher goes all around the house looking, because I know someone's here, but I can't find him. He leaves, she runs over, opens up the door. He was kind of hot, but oh, yeah. he was free. So that was a good thing. And this is the home of John and Hannah Cox. And uh, they provided shelter in the basement, in the attic, and they had the winter's walk here. Mm -hmm. So that someone could be up there watching for slave catchers coming towards the house. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jenner or uh, Longwood, the area there. Mm -hmm. And do you know where the Dunkin' Donuts is? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Right across the street, I'll show you. What the heck, I'll show you the slide now. Right across from the type of donuts is this whitewashed house. That's the way that that's the way the house looks now. Mm -hmm. And the Dunkin' Donuts used to be a barn, and there was a tunnel that went from the home to the barn. Because remember, there's a lot of woods back then. So if someone, if a slave catcher came into the house, they'd put them down, go down the basement, go through the tunnel, and then come up into the barn and then off into the woods to escape. This home is currently owned by Longwood Gardens and my hope is that someday that they will restore it because I think this would make it amazing <coughs> museum. Mm -hmm. If they can do a what is it, 5.5 million dollar renovation, you know, they're adding on, which I think is great. I mean I'm looking forward to it, but come on, throw a little bit of change towards this place. So, this is the home of uh, Dr. Bartholomew Fussell. Some, some say fusel, some say fussel, and I get fussed at whenever I use one or the other term. <laughs> but this provided uh, a safe haven for freedom seekers, and they, he would hide them in the root cellar. Like Aunt Preston, being a medical doctor, he could provide medical care, food, clothing, shelter, and his was one of the most active underground railroad stations in Southern Chester County. He personally assisted over 2,000 freedom seekers. And then there were many black conductors who were essential to the success of the Underground Railroad. There she is, Harriet Tubman. She's probably the most famous and well-known Underground Railroad conductor. She made at least 19 journeys into the South to lead over 300 freedom seekers on their journey to uh, on the Underground Railroad. She carried a pistol with her, and she was no nonsense. If you started whining and said, I don't want to do it, she caught the gun and said, okay, you got a choice. You got to come with me or you're dead. 
you, you choose. <laughs> they all went with us. <laughs> so she chose two underground railroad routes, one up through Wilmington, and the other was up through Oxford, Pennsylvania. And um, coming up 52 is the line house, and that's right where Delaware and Pennsylvania meet. And uh, it's reported that the first time she made the trip, she knew she was crossing into Pennsylvania, and she said, I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. Now I was free. There was such glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. And that's what she wanted to do. She, every person she transported, she wanted them to experience that feeling of freedom. You know, and that's one of the things that I think what's so good about Juneteenth is it really kind of wakes people up. You know, I think we take freedom for granted, so many of us, and to realize what people went through and what they had to endure. So uh, the African Americans in Wilmington referred to Thomas Garrett as our Moses. The enslaved people in the South just called her Moses. And Tom, Thomas Garrett said to Harriet one time, you're like a Quaker. You appear to uh, follow the inner light. And she told, she, Harriet told Garrett, uh, I don't know about the inner light, that, that what you're talking about. However, I know God will preserve me from harm in all my journeys, because I never go anywhere without his consent. And she's buried up in Auburn, New York, and the plaque there it says she was so proud that she never lost a single person when she took them on the journey. Now, how many of you know about her military duty? Oh, wow. Congratulations. That's awesome. Do you want to talk? No. <laughs> she, she, for the Union Army, she was a, a nurse and she was a spy, and she was the first woman to command an mili armed military raid. She guided Colonel James Montgomery and a 2nd South Carolina Black Regiment into battle. They scattered Confederate forces, they destroyed weapons, and they liberated over 750 enslaved people. In honor of her work, Queen Victoria sent her a silver medal and said, anytime you're in England, stop by. Well, she never made it over to England. <laughs> in 1982, Harriet Tubman was honored by the Smithsonian Institute as being the only American woman not just African American, any, any American woman ever to plan a military aid raid. Of course, now with the Iraq war, I'm sure other females have done that, but back then that was pretty amazing. So two places, three places actually. The Harriet Tubman, I'll show it to you. There's the Harriet Tubman, uh, Underground Railroad National Historic Park and Visitor Center in Cambridge. And then if you go into downtown Cambridge, there's the little, you've been there to the Little Museum. Yeah, I did a presentation down there. And uh, Linda, she's great, really, really awesome person. And then in Cape May, there's also the Harris Tubman Museum. But see, how long did it take, you know, for, for this to be recognized? And like, it's as a visitor, yeah. go ahead. No, because it is, and that one's right here, it's fairly new. Yeah. 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 And it was like, if you want to know anything about, and this is another, if you have grandchildren or children, take them here as well, because they talk at length about um, Thomas Garrett. Another fellow uh, black African-American was James Walker. He lived in Kenneth Square, and he was very active in the Underground Railroad, and he worked with Thomas Garrett. And there was a story, there was a freedom seeker on a railroad. He was coming from Maryland, and the train engineer was an abolitionist, so he said, you know, he helped him get on the train, and he said, look, you know, before you get to the Wilmington Station, because a lot of times slave catchers hang out there, jump off the train as it's slowing down. Well, he did, but it really hurt his ankle, and uh, some people carried him, put him in a wagon and brought him to uh, the Walker family's home. And there he was cared for by Dr. Johnson and Nurse Esther Hayes. And about three years later, this kind of distinguished looking black gentleman shows up at Dr. Johnson's office and asks if he's in. So oh, yes, so he went in and he said, do you remember me? And he said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. And he said, well, he said, you're the one, you and Nurse Hayes care for me. And 
because most enslaved people were given a number, not a, a name. He, the name he chose for himself was Johnson Hayes Walker, <laughs> after you know, James Walker, Dr. Johnson, and Nurse Hayes. Another fellow who was active was Thomas Fitzgerald. He lived in Hensonville, which we'll talk about in a minute. You know about Hensonville? We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a descendant, that's all. Hmm? I'm a descendant of Bertolt. Oh, neat. So Thomas is born and house were located in Hensonville. It was a station on the Underground Railroad. And uh, what would happen is people would show up. And he said, well, I'll put you up in the barn, but let me ask you a question. Do you, do you smoke cigars, pipe? And if they said yes, he said, give me all your material, because I don't want you burning the barn down. Yeah. And he said, in the morning, I'll provide breakfast, or if you want to leave beforehand, I'll have it outside the barn for you to take with you. And then there was also the abolitionist movement. And as I said before, abolition means to abolish something. And there were many people, many Quakers lived in the Canada area, Included Isaac and Dinah Mendenhall, who you saw, John and Hannah Cox, Eusebius and Sarah uh, Barnard, Moses and Mary Pennock, Thomas Garrett. And not only were they staunch abolitionists, they were also founding members of the Longwood Progressive Friends meeting. And there's an older picture of the house. And the Quakers believed in two sets of laws. They believed there were God's laws and man-made laws. And what they felt was, if a man-made law violated one of God's laws, they went with God's law. And that's why they said, all human beings are God's children. We are not going to own slaves, and we're going to do whatever we can. Well, there was the rub. The conservative Quakers were like, we no longer own slaves. That's all we have to do. We're done. The progressives were like, look, let's have action, not just words. So that's why they, so many of them got involved with the Underground Railroad, they got involved with the abolitionist movement. And the, was, the technical name is the Pennsylvania Yearly Meeting of Progressive Friends. And it was founded by mainly uh, Quaker abolitionists, but other like-minded people as well. And they just felt it was so important to uh, be involved with means to help the enslaved people. So, but unfortunately, some of the local Quaker meetings didn't approve of the radical and worldly abolitionist activists because they were too vocal about their opposition to slavery as well as the need for immediate emancipation. So people like Joanna Hannah Cox, they were, they were um, disowned by their, their meeting, as were others. And that's when they decided to come together. So in 1853, 58 men and women formed the Pennsylvania Yearly Meeting of Progressive Friends. And it continued until 1940, at which time Pierre DuPont purchased the property. <laughs> and now it's home to the Brandywine Valley Tourism Information. And just recently, if you've been down to Longwood, not too long ago, there was scaffolding all the way around because they replaced the windows, they replaced a lot of the siding. So at least Longwood's putting money into some of the buildings. And you go in there, and it's, it's like, most of you have probably been to Gettysburg, or you've been down to the Vietnam Memorial. You know, it's like kind of hallowed ground. You go in here, it's just kind of, you just feel it. Mm -hmm. or, or if you go to, who is it, um, in Nashville, the uh, Grand Ole Opry House. Oh, yeah. And you walk in, you just feel, you just feel the history there. So uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's also the National Park Service Network of Freedom Sites. And it is on. The Harriet Tubman Byway. It's one of the stops. If you do the, the byway, walk up from the south from Cambridge, you go there. Now, Longwood had a number of famous speakers, one of which was Frederick Douglass. I mean, he, he, had, he was, had escaped slavery. He was a passionate orator of the evils of slavery and the need to end it. Another one, I said my cousin, Harry Beecher Stowe. The Langs and the Beechers lived in Litchfield, Connecticut, and they were close friends. And my great-grandfather, his name was um, Herbert Beecher Lanyon, and he was named after Harry Beecher. And we all know her famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. At the time, her novel was the second uh, most purchased and read 
book in the world. Can you want to guess what the first one was? Very good. Okay. Yeah. And the impact on the nation, it's, it started off as just like a serial you know, in, in magazines because she wanted to talk about the, the horrors of slavery. And then it turned into, like, so often it happens. I remember with Jaws, when Jaws first came out, it was in magazine form. You know, you read like a chapter, and then, and then finally you put it into book form. But um, the impact on the nation was so powerful. When Abraham Lincoln met with her, he said, so you're the woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Because you see, in the North, a lot of people, you know, they were like, they didn't know anything about what was going on. They didn't know about slavery. They, you know, they had heard about it, but they didn't really know anything. And her book really opened up so many people's eyes to what was going on. And then other speakers at Longwood were John Green, Greenleaf Whittier, Sojourner Truth, Lucretia Mott, and others. And how many know that, that uh, Longwood Progressive Friends meeting had an impact on Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation? No? You probably know because you read the book. Well, I just got it yesterday. Oh, okay. Well, okay. You, 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 you could slide on that one. Okay. But members of, of the, the meeting lobbied for the emancipation of enslaved people. And on June 20th, 1862, three men and three women met with Lincoln. One was William Barnard, who was Lincoln's cousin, Thomas Garrett, and Dinah Mendenhall. And they presented him with a petition. That's what they called it back then, a petition. It was like a Whatever, you want to call it. So, here it is, this is what you want to read. He said, well, I'm going to rely on my inner light to guide me. And what's the, what, I should, what steps that I should take? So in around right about August, he presented a rough draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to Congress. And on January 1st, 1863, he signed the bill into law. Now, as I said, I live in West Grove, which is near Kenneth Square. And on the opposite side of West Grove, there used to be a little town called Hensonville. And it's located six miles from the Mason-Dixon line. Hensonville is made up of free blacks, freed blacks, and freedom-seeking blacks. And what would happen is um, people would come on Sundays. You know, enslaved people were given off Saturday afternoon until Sunday afternoon, and so they could come there to Hosanna Church, which we'll talk about in a second, for service, and they usually held two services. The first service was very staid, very quiet, you know, because the, the slave masters or the catchers would kind of hang out, they'd get bored, so they'd leave. Well then, oh boy, everything broke loose, they started singing and clapping and you know, just having a good old time. And if the slave catcher wasn't back in time, the freedom seeker would just get in the carriage, was one of the free blacks, and off they'd go. But the up until the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, African Americans could only serve as laborers. They could be a cook, they could be a stable hand, you know, they could care for the horses, but they could not enlist in the army. Once the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, Lincoln said they can serve in the army. So 18 Hansonville men signed up for the Union Army. Six of those 18 enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. It was comprised of 1,007 African Americans and 37 white officers. And on July 18, 1863, Colonel Shaw led 600 of his men into the battle for Fort Wagner. Shaw was instantly killed and 280 soldiers were killed as well. And if you've ever seen the movie Glory, yeah. that's what this is about. Yeah. The Confederates threw all 280 African Americans along with Colonel Shaw in one unmarked grave they contacted the Union military stating we have buried Shaw with his, a very unflattering term used for African Americans. And the parents of Colonel Shaw were asked, well, what, what do you think about this? You know, him being buried with all these African Americans? And, and they said, quote, they could think of, quote, no holier place for their son to be buried than surrounded by brave and devoted soldiers. Mm -hmm. And it totally backfired on the Confederates because they thought, because they had said, we're going to kill any, any, any and all soldiers, including the officers, if you show up. And they figured they'd be like, oh my gosh, we're scared. And instead, they're like, oh heck no, we're going to go for it. You know, they did. So, Hosanna Church, 
Uh, this is the only building left from Hansonville. And uh, of the 18 men who enlisted in the Union Army, 17 returned home, nine are buried at Hosanna Church. And uh, this was a uh, station on the Underground Railroad. Harry Tubman used to stop in here. The Amos brothers helped <laughs> raise money to build the church. And it was one of the first graveyards in the United States to have gravestones that had the name, the, the given name, and some of them actually had African names of, of, their, of who they were. There's the historic meeting. So being part of Hansonville afforded Paul Walson Amos, James Walson Amos, to meet the Reverend Dickey, because James Walson was a itinerant <coughs> preacher, but he didn't know much about scripture, he didn't know much about theology. He had walked four miles one way to the Oxford Presbyterian Church to meet with Reverend Dickey to get some lessons, and then he walked the four miles back. So, but then as what um, Reverend Dickey did, well, he was a missionary to enslaved people in Georgia, so people knew him, and they knew of his heart for enslaved people. Well, prior to mentoring him, he tried to put him in, place him in two different uh, Presbyterian schools. One was Dickey's alma mater, Princeton Seminary, and you know, he sent a letter, and I like this person, oh, this sounds great. And then he shows up, and they're like, Wait a minute, you're black. Yeah. You're like, yeah. You're like, really? Jeez. Thanks for informing me. They said, no, we don't want you here. And the other was the Presbyterian Synod of Philadelphia Religious Academy. Same thing, he showed up and they're like, no, we don't want you. So that's when Dickey started tutoring him. But Dickey was just getting busier and busier. So he said, you know what? We ought to open, we should start a, a seminary here so people can get um, theological training. So what happened was Lincoln University was first known as Ashman Institute and later renamed um, Lincoln University. And Hansonville was unlike most of the other towns, like you see the abandoned towns out west. Uh, they did, it didn't just fall into decay. Lincoln started buying up land from the owners. You know, they didn't take it, they bought it up. And so what happened was the oldest historically de um, black degree granting university in the United States wound up taking over the village of Hensonville. And what Lincoln University originally did was train missionaries to go to Africa. But what happened was once the Emancipation Proclamation happened, and here you have all these free blacks, none of which knew how to read or write because the slave masters didn't want them to know how to read or write because they might get hold of a newspaper or read Harry Tubman's book and go, wait a minute, this is, the, we, they knew it in their heart it was wrong, but now in their heads they can go, this is really wrong. So they kept them completely ignorant. And that's when Lincoln switched from being primarily a missionary training school to training teachers so they could go out and, and teach so many of the free uh, enslaved people. And Amos Hall, it's really kind of cool, you can't really see it, but one of the freezes is Abraham Lincoln, the other is James Ross and Amos. And what's really great is all that's left is just the front of the uh, building and now the building behind it. You know, you've been there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's really neat because when I go back on campus, you know, to see all the work that's being done, it's just really awesome. So uh, just to be able to you know, to work on this book, it was just such a I learned so much. And my wife, she would kind of like proofread the book as she was. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I was telling Mark. Um, I've just finished the manuscript for my second book, submitted it to the publisher, and it's supposed to be published at the end of October. It's called Lost Chester County, The Unknown, Little Known, and Forgotten History of Chester County. So 
lot of really neat things there. So that's the that's my presentation. Now, does anyone have any questions? No, great. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, before uh, we take questions, I. Since you're done with the presentation here, I'm going to turn the screen so that people on Zoom can oh, actually see good. you. Uh, oh, and also, and also you hear this click, 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 click. Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> sign off. All right. So if if you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes. It, it seems like you know a lot, and you, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. No, I Hensonville is. Um, I have my, my family helped found. Was it the Walls? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, do you know Rick and Angie Walls? There are a lot of us. Okay, because Rick and Angie live in, we're good friends with them. They live in yeah, Virginia. all our family still lives all yeah. throughout right. Chester County. Yeah. Okay. And also in West Grove. Nice, and, neat. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Kenneth, Kenneth Square, which I'll be in Saturday for the Trinity team to be around. <laughs> uh, also, do some more reenacting. Because oh. one of the six guys that are buried, they're all family, but my third great grandfather is uh, William J. He's buried <laughs> at the church. Yep, yeah. and we'll see. Hmm. There were three performing? brothers, Wes, Wesley J, George J, and William, who's the oldest of the three. And then three first cousins also served. Hmm. Do you know the story of how they got there? Well, my family originally are from, yes, these are all uh, mm -hmm. Albert Walls, who, that's who passed right. at, uh, at Fort Wagner. Where people were free uh, people living in Maryland over the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah. And the reason why it became over is because they wanted to start buying land. Mm -hmm. And the Quakers were who were selling land right. to people who were then free long before the Civil War. Right. So like Henry Hanson, he, he bought Yeah, they all came together. They all came from right. Hartford County right over, really literally right over the Mason-Dixon mm -hmm. line. And they had the Amos brothers who moved down from... Yeah, and there were also people already here. But in the, the word got out that, hey, here's a free black community. And so for 40 years, Hansonville was in existence, and it was just an amazing <coughs> situation. Sure. You know? So, yeah, that's awesome. So, and you had a question. I wanted to hear his story. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, that, that's it. Yeah, yeah we're going to be at Lincoln Sunday for the dinner Sunday. Yeah. How do you spell Henson? Is it H-E-N or H-I-N? H-I-N. Hansonville, named after Emory Henson. Yes. Who also wasn't really the first to, be, to buy land there. He was the first to live there. Correct. Uh, our, my uncle, uh, one of the brothers of my fourth great grandmother, were buying land all around. But uh, he was the first to actually set up shop and start farming there. So that's why the Hamlet was named mm -hmm. after him. And that's the thing, it's like talking with Brenda Allen, she's the president of Lincoln, she and I are pretty good friends, and she's like, my students need to hear it. Most of them don't even know Hensonville, anything. They, they're right here, they're walking across the land that used to be Hensonville, and they don't have a clue what it is. Folks on Zoom, if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself right now. Or you can type it into the chat if you feel comfortable doing that. And for people on Zoom, do you know, or most of them from around here? Yes, they would because be, yes. What's the name of the bookstore? That's called Good. Reads Incorporated. Reads, Reads and, and Company. company. And Reads and company. company, sorry, yeah. and Company. Yeah, it carries the book. Good. And you also can order on Amazon. That's what I was going to ask. Do you yeah. have any here? And also we have books here if you want. Okay. That are available. I'm glad to sign them for you. But, yes. um, see, that's the thing. It's like so many people, that's why I'm writing the book about the lost Chester County because doing these presentations people are like I never knew that I never knew this I never knew that yeah and, uh, like you said there are so many different areas throughout Chester County that have significant of whatever it may be and it's hidden or it was hidden and then not talked about it so uh, or people came and moved there and didn't know because I was well, so like New London Academy how yeah. many people know about New London Academy Three of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were educated at New London Academy, plus 20 other graduates. They went on to be senators, uh, judges, governors, and uh, a friend of mine, John Lawrence, who's in the House of Representatives, he said 
Uh, he really believes if it weren't for a new London Academy, America wouldn't mm -hmm. exist. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask the same question that yeah, Sarah, who's online, she wants to know if you have anything uh, to say about the um, Phoenixville area underground railroad, because there are, does, yeah, I've heard there's, there, are, there are some places mm -hmm. that, that right. are Right. Well, what happened was, and this is one of the questions when I'm in, outside of my territory, people are like, why don't you write about my place? Well, I'm limited to what I could put into the book, and I wrote mainly about southern Chester County, and I was going to make the title in Southern Chester County, but the publisher said, no, we're going to call it Chester County. Okay. But there are other places, like there's the Vickers, um, that's part of, was part of the Underground Railroad, and there's other places, and that could well be a, a third book you know, that I've read. So many books. Like Pennsylvania as a whole, like this state has given so much. Um, the people, you know, so yeah, there are so many. Well, and that's why. Uh, Voices Underground, they are in charge of all the Juneteenth, major Juneteenth celebrations in the state of Pennsylvania because so many places in Pennsylvania. Plus, you have to remember the Underground Railroad, like um, Harriet Tubman, she went straight up into New York because what would, what would occur? Uh, that's a good question about Coatesville. And yeah, what are Coatesville's contributions to the underground? Railroad? Same is the question. It went right through, like so it, it, it straight up the middle from Merrill to Hensonville, and then cut up and over. So Coatesville, it's really right out. I mean, that's the closest to Philly. Yeah, even and here. Philadelphia was very active in the yeah. underground railroad too. You know, and of course, there's been other books written like about Philadelphia. So, um, but for me. I just focused on the, the, that area. Plus, anything in the book was something I could verify. And I was telling this lady, she was here a little bit early, and the house we used to live in, in Chatham, Pennsylvania, was considered a way station for the underground railroad. There wasn't an underground railroad station, but if, like, the Coxes or the men in halls got jammed up, they could take a couple of people and then keep them for a night and then move them on, because they didn't want to be actively involved, because like Thomas Garrett, he, what happened to him with the Fugitive Slave Law, the, they came in, they, they took his business away from him, they bankrupted him because he was active in the Underground Railroad. People in Wilmington who really cared about him loaned him the money to get him back in business and he was successful so he paid them all back. But people literally, they were taking their lives in their hands, they were taking their fortunes in their hands by helping the Underground Railroad. So, some people didn't want to be actively involved, but they would like periodically help out. Yes? One of the things that always amazed me is the Southerners said that the Confederacy said that this was all about state rights. Mm -hmm. But the state right is what was being blocked by the Fugitive Slave Law. Mm -hmm. In a state like Pennsylvania, slavery was not legal, and yet you were being told by the federal government you cannot mm -hmm. interfere or participate in people becoming free. Correct. It, it was blocking the, the rights of the people in Pennsylvania to follow their own laws that said slavery was illegal. That was better. the state right that was being blocked. Yes, sir. Well, and that was like, you know, many of you probably heard of the Christiana riot. Yes. And what happened with that is there was um, William Parker and his brother in law, they were hiding some freedom seekers at their home, and then up comes, uh, oh, Castor, not Castor, they came up, Edward Gorsuch came up to capture them. Well, they had guns, and they shot him, and they, they uh, severely injured his son. Well, I went to court, and just like you were saying, this is Pennsylvania, they threw it out. A lot of people say that's what really triggered the Civil War because mm -hmm. the Southerners were saying, this is a federal law and you're not enforcing it? You know, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, and so we're going to make sure it is enforced. And that's, so what, what happened was Frederick Douglass, the, the Underground Railroad, that brought them up to Rochester, New York, the, the, the William Parker, his brother-in-law, and um, they, Frederick Douglass escorted him to, them to a ship that took him over to Canada. And as a thank you, William Parker presented Frederick Douglass with a pistol that he took from 
the dead slave owner. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. <laughs> when was the Underground Railway bus active? 1835 to 1855. We're about there. What about that gap between before the Civil War? Well, there were things going on, but there wasn't as active because you, know, you had the, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 and then the next one, 1850. So things were really beginning to percolate as far as um, people wanting to help with the Underground Railroad. So, it wasn't so those as laws before. really slowed down the Underground Railroad? You know, no one had, those laws actually sped up the Underground Railroad oh. because you know, here you have slave catchers who felt empowered to cross over into free states and snag. First of all, um, technically they were given the legal right to snag freedom seekers. Mm -hmm. But then they corrupted that and said, well, we'll just snag anybody we want, you know? And then that's when, that's what really got a lot of people riled up. So that the Quakers and other like-minded people saying, we need to do something in order to protect these people. So why do you say that the Underground Railroad quieted down in 1855? Well, I would just saying that was the most active time. Oh. Yeah. So at least yeah, it never stopped until, but as far as like being like, people were, because I mean, I remember more so were the people who were keeping people safe, but people were still coming and going, going through different ways to, to get to where they needed to get to. But but also that that was leading up to the Civil War, so it was really like you said, slave owners weren't just taking anyone, so it was like all men, you know, basically all every man for themselves. And so, yeah, but that the, the you know, eight, this what the war started in eighteen. 60. Yes, so it was really yeah. close. Okay. Right, yeah. Like I said, it was really hot. You know. There's a question from uh, someone on the Zoom that I've just lost. <laughs> uh, we'll get you. He's asking about uh, other books similar to yours that focus on Chester County. He says he's familiar with uh, one titled Hinsonville something. I Heroes. Um, no, not that one, but I was going just about to tell him about that one. There is one called Hinsonville's Heroes, Black Civil War Soldiers of Chester County, yeah, Pennsylvania, Cheryl. by Cheryl Renee Gooch, who we had here in the library uh, a couple of years ago talking about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's Hinsonville, which was written by the Russos, yes. Mary Ann Russo and her husband. Um, Hinsonville, a community at the crossroads, yeah, right. is the yes. book that this... Uh, Person yeah, is familiar that's with. Which is very hard to find and very yeah. expensive to find. I went online because the, the library had one copy. So I thought, well, because I, I like to you know, underline one. Yeah. I'm going to do that to a library. I won't do it to a library <laughs> book, I promise you. <laughs> so I went online. Amazon had one for $1,000. Oh, yeah, I have 10 copies only for like search them out and buy them, but they were, oh. I bought some two, three, four, five, but now, yeah. So they're very hard to find. Right. Wow. But you definitely you can go to a library, it's very, very cool. So they, they finally said, do you want to just, do, they were going to give me the book, because I check, checked out like 12 so times. So many times, yeah. Well, it could be your retirement. It could be. Uh, it's, I really don't know why, it's a thousand dollars or so. Yeah. It needs to say, I didn't buy it. I just like, got the hat. Well, if there's no more questions, you know, thank you so much. And as I say, if you want, I have some copies. I'll be glad to uh, sign them for you. And uh, thank you for being here. That yeah. 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 I came from Philadelphia. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, I, yeah, I'd love to support anybody who's going to Chester County, especially related to my family. It's even more so for you. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And when you see pictures of reenactors, you will know. He's always the tallest one. Now, do you like reenact with Cheryl? Well, Cheryl, I do reenacting, and well, with the 54, there's, in reenacting, there's guys that uh, take on regiments. And right. so, uh, since my family were a part of the 54 mm -hmm. Massachusetts Company B, there are guys in Maryland, Virginia that do that. So, I reenact with them. But in Philadelphia, uh, Lucretia Mott and uh, Camp Leon Penn, uh, they're in the Union League of Philadelphia, they had. Uh, 
gave money to start regiments there. And so I do uh, act reenacting with uh, the third regiment. It was okay. the first regiment out of Philadelphia um, mm -hmm. that the Union League uh, helped fund. So I do a lot of reenacting. So I'm always in the county. I'm always in the route of the county. So if you, you, if you ever come to anything that has reenacting there or living history, like yeah. booths, then you, you might run into me because I'm six foot seven. <laughs> and actually my grandfather, who third great grandfather who fought in the Civil War, he was on his service records, he was six foot. So well, for him, even during that time, that was pretty tall. Yeah. 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 So, but not six seven. <laughs> that was really, you know. yeah, I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, and I'm part of the Philadelphia Continental Chapter Color Guard. So we were just in at Betsy Ross House mm -hmm. for Black Day. Yeah, I was down in for Black Day too. So, so we, are, we have our uniforms. And we yeah. were, so yeah. kind of fun. We have connections, and this is also why genealogy and history is important because the connections yeah. that a lot of us yeah. may have yeah. and won't know unless you go to her. Mm -hmm. So the work you're doing is. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for coming and everybody on Zoom.